Hello there, it's Peter Marshall again, uh, the Apache Druid Technology Evangelist working in the community team at Imply. In this little video today, I'm going to talk about my experience of Apache Druid, how it differs to the database technologies that I came across when I started working in 1998. And speaking of which, at that time I was working with an Oracle database and I used to spend lots of time working with teams creating SQL statements that let me do things like data exports and mail merges and the occasional regular report and then one day someone says you should buy Oracle Business Objects. So we did and I started spending lots of time creating very fancy diagrams that looked like tube max that nobody really understood but they were really really cool I thought anyway and that enabled people to do an element of self-service reporting direct from the database but it was really slow. That didn't actually matter that much because at that time people didn't really need it to be fast. There were a few people who were asking for very specific things and I could craft the best SQL statement in the universe to make it as performant as possible. But there were banks who started to have gigabytes of data. So while my SQL statements were great for printing statements out, they weren't particularly fast and over very large volumes of data were well, they were pretty terrible to run, actually. You had to wait days and days for things to actually be calculated, like averages or sum totals. So a gentleman called Edgar F. Codd said, No, Peter Marshall, stop doing that. That's ridiculous. And he introduced this way of doing meaningful analytics on data. He started a movement to take data out of the databases and carry out a level of curation and do calculations for those kind of analytics ahead of time and make it available really quickly and this resulting technical solution was called the data cube so not only do those standard reports i was creating run much faster but also i get an element of slicing and dicing the data based on different dimensions say a customer segment or maybe i'll have a hierarchy i can drill down into the data using starting at the continent for example and going right down to the city and i can have some pretty complicated statistical questions answered for me through this system all available online and that was the birth of online analytical processing and then the internet happened. Massive volumes of data were generated by websites and later by mobile applications, and the nature of business itself changed. Physical shops were replaced with online ones, local shops were replaced with international online e-commerce websites. And this ETL technology to create these data cubes began to creak for two reasons. First of all, ETL itself takes time. The bigger your database is, the longer ETL takes to run. That's the volume and velocity problem we're all familiar with now. And an ETL, to make it go faster, costs money. You need cores, you need memory, you need extra disk space. Secondly, ETL takes design. That's the variety problem. You can only take advantage of this data cube if it's been built ahead of time to answer your question. If you need something new, if you've got a new question, if you want to go and have a conversation with the data, or heaven forbid your underlying database or application changes, those data engineers and your teams have to spend hours and hours updating the ETL processes and redesigning your data cube and calculating over and over again. Enter Google, Yahoo, LinkedIn, Netflix, Amazon, our other big friends. They started with a different question. They said, if I've got this kind of data and it's about this kind of thing and I've got these kinds of questions, then what should the database be? And the result was different data storage systems that were specific to different business scenarios, or as I call them, data first use cases. We had columnar databases, they split up our underlying spreadsheets and tables into different files. They distribute them. They put them on different disks, different computers, even with the advent of cloud, into different countries. And they're able to answer the questions that we have in parallel across these huge numbers of worker bees. And we ask questions using type appropriate programming code. And I get the answer almost instantly if my question is about one column, about one dimension. It's fantastic for statistics. For example, Netflix were using it to calculate average film ratings. 
Then we had the advent of log search systems fantastic ingestion capabilities for fast moving real-time data. I could go and look at customer journeys on websites. I could monitor telecommunications traffic. I could look at stock market transactions. I myself used to use a system like this to monitor application error logs for websites. I could filter. I could search and really drill into the data. And we had time series databases. They are fantastic pieces of functionality for people who want to break down statistics into chunks of time. What's my daily customer numbers? How did my advertising campaign perform this week better than last week? And we had others like document databases for semi-structured data and graph databases for understanding relationships between things. Now, this is great if you want Macaulay Culkin in your data architecture. He's great at one specific thing. But analytics is a universal business problem. Columnar databases aren't designed to ingest very large volumes of real-time data from the ground up. And they're not particularly brilliant at searching when you compare them to log search systems. But log search systems are terrible for statistical calculations. And they're not so good at data with lots of columns, what we say high dimensionality. And you run into big problems if you've got lots of different values, so high cardinality. And time series databases are great for windowed aggregations and for windowed comparisons, but not so good at drilling down or slicing and dicing in statistics and using other columns like a customer segment. In comes Druid. Druid brings together the ingestion, the flexible schemas, the text search capabilities we find in these log search databases. It has optimizations for time series data and for time based functions that we get from time series databases. And it has the efficient storage, the super fast statistical performance we'd find in a modern columnarized cloud OLAP data warehouse. And what Druid gives you, therefore, is a very mature and scalable ingestion capability, many millions of events per second if you need to. It has a distributed query engine. It scales to give hundreds of users answers to all sorts of statistical questions at sub-second speed. And what's more, those questions are not determined by what your data cube or your ETL process has been programmed to look like. It's true ad hoc interactive conversations with the data. And you get a very refined and optimized storage system that can hold both historical and current data in one place cost effectively. And in many cases, that means that an architect might decide to swap out a NoSQL database engine or a database or a data warehouse, like a time series database, so that you get more statistical flexibility or maybe you'll supplement your existing log search system so that you get much faster interactive analytics. So what can Druid do for people? Let's start with some things that appeal to the technologists and the product managers out there. You can use Druid to shrink the effort of engineering the solution overall, the true life cycle, as you remove the pre-calculation and the ETL processes from your pipeline. And because Druid is able to handle high cardinality and high dimensionality data, those data sets you've currently got locked away inside a cupboard that you just can't process quickly enough, you can make those available to people for doing their analysis. And because Druid is flexible at its heart with things like schema on read, if you've got data sources that change frequently, you can use Druid to analyze those with much less effort than you would if you were having to look after these pre-computation processes. And what about the decision makers out there? Well, it gives you the opportunity to use real-time data for those time-sensitive decisions. And I don't mean just looking at the analytics the next day, I mean looking at them instantly the moment that that data has been generated. You can use it to bring in historical data from those large data sets from a data lake or a data warehouse and allow people to slice and dice and have a conversation with that data interactively. And you can use it to bring data together, to break down the silos that have been caused by different technological issues or because you have issues where you've separated data according to its uh, time. In other words, your real-time data and your historical data can be brought together. 
And you can give all of this functionality to people on their own terms. They're no longer limited by what your OLAP cube or your ETL process says that they can have or what you can afford to give them because of the cost. Now you can use Druid to give this interactive conversation to anybody. If you have any questions about what I've said, please email me, peter.marshall at imply.io or reach out to the community team, community at imply.io. Come and say hi to us on the Druid channel, ASF Slack, or see us in the Druid user groups on Google Groups.